Hello everybody, this is Dan Miller for Bluegrass Unlimited Magazine and today we're doing part two of banjo backup, beginning banjo backup. Um, last time we talked, just gave an overview about my ideas about playing backup in general and then we uh, talked about three basic um, umbrellas you could put banjo back up under. One was kind of what the vamp or the boom chick or just the chick. You know, some people call it a vamp, some people call it a chuck or a, a chick. Um, that kind of thing. We, we discussed that last time. The next part would be rolls and then the third part would be like some, some fills or fill in links. And so um, I'm not going to do anything more on the vamp kind of thing. I'll, I'll let you sit with what we did last time. Of course, there, there is more, but I'll let you sit with that and practice that, and this time we're going to talk about rolls. Now, again, uh, in the context of what you do as a rhythm player um, and when to decide to do these different techniques, like I said last time, it's going to depend on the ensemble and what other people in the ensemble are doing. For instance, the main idea of rhythm is that you want the downbeat and a backbeat. It, and that's the numbers. If you're counting one and two and three and four, that's your one, two, three, and four. Usually your downbeats are on the one and three, your backbeats are on the two and the four, or your, your strum or whatever you want, or your boom and your chick. Your boom, that's one, chick is two, boom is three, chick is four, okay? And so if you have a bass player doing that uh, for the downbeat and you have a mandolin um, chunk in that backbeat, and um, maybe you have a guitar kind of right there in the middle range doing a little bit of both. Um, you don't want to just repeat what other people are doing. So you can, through your banjo roll, add something on those and beats, especially if the, 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 the bass is going boom and the mandolin is going chick and the guitar is going boom, chick, boom, chick. Um, what's missing is those and beats. There's nothing on those and beats. And when you fill in your roll, because it's like a uh, eighth note roll, um, you're going to be filling in those ands with something and it's going to be this continuous rolling thing. Um, and even if the guitar player is what we call subdividing and playing some of those and beats, a guitar, a guitar that aren't playing and beats is going boom, chick, boom, chick. But some guitar players go boom, chicka, boom, chicka, and those uh are on the ands. And some of them do like the Jimmy Martin rumble rhythm where it's going boom ba chicka boom ba chicka boom ba chicka. They're playing completely subdivided. They're playing eighth notes as well. And that's why a lot of banjo players said it was fun to play with that kind of style of rhythm that Jimmy had because they can match their role with Jimmy's boom ba chicka boom ba chicka boom ba chicka. And it would, uh, if they could get it tight, it, it was a real dynamic and energetic sound. Anyway, um, if you have, if you're just playing in a duo, such so you and a guitar player, um, you know, you might have to fill one of those that boom chick roll, if, especially if the guitar player is going to be taking a solo and his rhythm falls out. So again, it depends on the ensemble, how many people are in the ensemble, and what those other players in the ensemble are doing in accordance with backup and accompaniment. Okay, so. Um, enough about that. Now, we said something about um, your goals are keeping time, outlining the chords, um, helping the listener ear uh, know that there's a, a change, a chord change coming, and then adding interest on top of that. You don't, don't want to be monotonous. And then, you know, above that, you're trying to help the singer or the, or the instrumentalist sound better, trying to add some... Um, uh, help the help the singer and the instrumentalist tell their story, get in the groove, uh, show some emotion, you know, uh, portray the emotion of the song. All those kind of things come in. But first, we have to get our basic nuts and bolts down. Okay. So in terms of playing a roll, you can just take any of your banjo rolls, your forward roll, your backward roll, your alternating roll, your forward backward roll, and just roll over the chord. That's the basic, most simple thing to do. For instance, if you were going through a GCD progression in, the, in uh, the, this position, the first five frets of the neck, you could just start out and go... Something simple like that, okay? Or you could use, use your close, close positions... Uh, you know, something like that.
like that. So it would just be rolling over the chord changes and that would f fulfill your timing if your timing's good and it would fulfill that idea of uh, outlining the chords because you're playing notes out of the chord. Not so much uh, if you're doing the same roll over and over again um, and just playing the notes of the chords. You're not really adding that much interest and you're not really outlining uh, uh, the change to the next chord or, or allowing the listeners to know there's a change coming, okay? You have to do a little bit more in order to add interest and then help predict the next change. And so that's what I'm gonna talk about right now. And the first thing to do to add a little bit of interest, okay, you got your three notes of the chord. The first uh, choice of another note to add would be the sixth note of the scale uh, that uh, relative to the root of the chord. So for a, a G uh, chord, you're going to add that E note. Adds a little bit more interest to it. You know, if you can go, or you could slide from there to the to the G note up here. So the G chord, you're going to add the E note. Under the C chord, you're going to add the A note. So the C chord, you could go. Gives you a little bit more than just playing a roll over the chord change. And for the for the uh, D note, D chord, you're going to add that B note. You know that kind of thing. You can add that one note, three notes of the chord plus the sixth scale degree of. Uh, uh, the scale relative to the root of the chord you're playing, and that's going to add interest there, okay? Now the next thing to do would be to add um, some sort of indication that the chord is about to change. So um, I could do this little, uh, add the, the second note of the scale to the G chord, which is an A, and I could do something like this. <laughs> So that, that sort of, that little roll lick helps, you can almost hear, okay, some change is coming. And I, all I did, again, was, or you could do, you could do an alternating thing, uh, like that, or you could just do, so you can hear, almost hear, something's going to happen, and then I change to that C note for my first note of the C chord. A lot of times I'll hit that C note there, or you can hit a, hit a double stop with the E and the C note there. You know, go into your C roll, okay? And there's a lot of things you could do. You don't necessarily just have to roll over that chord, although you can. And then again, when you're over that C chord, you can add your uh, A note in there, the sixth scale degree of the C scale. And then that, again, playing that E note and then the D note is a good indication of a move to the D chord. So let me, let me play something uh, um, along those lines. This, uh, a GCD playing rolls, adding some of that sixth scale degree and adding a little bit of movement uh, that helps the listener know a, a, a change is coming, a chord is coming in. And you know, uh, from the D moving to the G, you could even do a little walk up, something like. You know, so you got. A lot of ideas that you can work with. I'll tab some of these basic ideas out and you can work with those until you get them down. Work with, like I said before, work with one. Work with one little change moving from a rolling G to a C, then move from another change rolling C moving to D or moving back to G, and then work with just one from a D going back to G, and then work those over and over and over again every time you play back up so that they get into your muscle memory, so to speak, they get in uh, to your uh, intuitive sense of how those work and where they go. Okay, Okay. so those, those are some 
down the neck ideas that you can mess around with. Again, um, there's lots and lots and lots of combinations of different things that you can come up with, but the idea is first just to deal with your three notes of your chord and roll over them. Try that. And then try, try adding that E note to the G chord, the A note to the C chord, and the B note to the D chord to get a little bit more of a um, added interest. And then try to see if you can work little ways to, to move from one chord to the other with a little connecting lick, so to say. I'll tab out the ones I used here, practice those first, but then there's lots of others you can explore. Okay, the other thing, when I did the rolls up the neck before, I just kind of did a roll like that. Now, if you're on a G chord, you can play that open G, that short, you know, high G note. If you're on a C chord, you can play that because the G note is in those two chords. Once you get up to D, uh, not so much. You got to pretty much play these four strings closed in some fashion. And the same is true when you start to play in other other chords, in other other keys and other chords. If you're not capoing, you know, uh, relative to an open G, um, you got to watch playing that fifth string because if that G note is not in the chord, um, sometimes that's not going to sound good. So um, you get more. Get, you got to get patterns that are closed uh, in the sense that they just use these four strings. And so, you know, Earl was famous for, for lots of different ones. Um, I'll show you a couple here. One pattern is kind of like this. You know, you can go, if, you, if you move up to C, you can try something a little bit different. So again, I'll tab these out so you can see the difference. And maybe you go up to G, a, a D, and you do something a little bit different. You can do something like... Again, just a little bit different pattern, and you can mix those up. Uh, remember the last time when we did the vamp, we moved from a G position here up to this G position here, this inversion. Like that. You can do the same thing when you're doing these rolls. You can do something like... So, you can add interest by making that move between the chord inversions as well as you're rolling, okay? Um, another thing, you know, you could do, uh, move into a G position here, and instead of a roll, you have more of a single string thing, and Don Reno was famous for single string, but Earl, uh, he didn't do as much single string stuff in his leads, he did some, but not, not that much. Uh, but he did do it in backup, like this, this kind of lick where he went, So you're going from this kind of single string thing. And then, and then you can roll over the next chord and just interchange those kind of things. And there's lots of these different patterns. But again, I'm just going to show you a few of these kind of uh, patterns where you're rolling over this chord position. Um, when you're changing between the two or when you're going and doing like a single string kind of pattern. And then rolling into a, a roll on the, on the next chord up. And you can just, like I said, interchange all those things while you're playing. And the only thing to be careful of when you're doing these rolls or these kind of single string uh, fills uh, or, or, or backup patterns is just not to get in the way of the singer or the lead soloist. A lot of times these things that are more complex you want to stick in there when the singer pauses. Uh, you don't want to be busy behind the singer. But when the singer pauses there's space for something more complex that you could fill in. And you could, you could inter, intersperse these roll patterns along with your vamps or even your pinch in your in your uh, in your rolling you could you know add a, a little slide there a little slide there. you know the pattern
pinches work. Uh, a little slide or hammer on here or there works. So take these basic ideas and these basic concepts of um, what I've put forth today, uh, both in the open and the closed position as far as some rolling and uh, single string little ideas that go along with playing backup and try to work them into uh, your backup when you're playing at your jam or with your band or um, again if you don't have anybody to play with put in some records and try these things it's uh, it's a lot of fun it might be frustrating at first especially with the tempos those guys are playing at but if you go to YouTube and you probably know you can go to the little uh, tool setting and slow down uh, to three quarters half or quarter speed on YouTube so yeah do a Flat Scruggs or Bluegrass Album Band or whatever, Stanley's Monroe, whatever you like, um, and figure out the key. And I, you know, lots of videos ago, I told you about how to figure out the key by going to the last note of the song, figure out the key they're playing in, um, and then play along, you know. And I think that you'll have a lot of fun doing that, and you'll get practice going over and over and over again with your backup. So um, next time, we'll talk a little bit about various fill licks that you can put in that space when the um, singer pauses. Some down the neck fill licks and some up the neck fill licks that are pretty cool. So until next time, this is Dan Miller from Bluegrass Unlimited Magazine. Thanks and good picking.